Okay, let's do this. Can everybody see me? Can everybody hear me? How's the transmission? Welcome to another Myersound webinar. Uh, very much looking forward to today's webinar. We have uh, a guest lecture uh, that's going to speak about uh, the AMI system, multi-channel plug and play. So without further ado, uh, let's get into business. I will start sharing my screen, take care of the household notes, and then we'll hand it over to our guest lecturer. Okay. So as I said, AMI system, multi-channel, plug and play, that's gonna be today's uh, content. But before doing so, uh, let me tell you about Zoom. Zoom is the video communication platform that we use to conduct these webinars. And that means that in front of you, you are expected to have a window, not unlike the one you see over here. If you would like to see who else is joining you on today's webinar, all you have to do is click on the participants button. Whenever you do that, a window pops up on the right hand side showing you your fellow attendees. We encourage you to ask questions also during the session, but in order to do so in an organized fashion, please make use of the raise hand feature. Notice that in the bottom right corner, there's a button which says raise hand. And whenever you click that button, a blue hand icon pops up in the corner of my eye, informing me that you are about to ask a question. Now, in order to ask that question, we encourage you to make use of the chat function. If you want to activate the chat function, all you have to do is click on the balloon icon, in which case the right hand window splits in half, bringing up a chat dialogue. There's a field at the bottom of the window where you can enter a message, which you can then address to everyone on the call. Or if you happen to see a friend, fellow family member or a colleague, then you can also address that person in private. That pretty much concludes the household notes. That being said, we're simulcasting to the Meyer Sound user community on Facebook as we speak. Um, so welcome to those people that are joining us there as well. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the Facebook group, the user community, is uh, growing at a steady pace, currently counting over 8,900 members and rising. So uh, that is exciting. That is uh, awesome. Uh, this is another place, another channel where you can watch these um, live webinars. And that means that without further, to, further ado, I would like you to uh, welcome today's guest lecture, um, we have Juan Sierra Lozano, again, Meyer Sound Acoustic Test Engineer, and today he will be talking about the AMI system, multi-channel plug and play. Juan Sierra, are you with us? Yes. Hey, how are you guys doing? Excellent. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you told me that you brought a guest, so um, it's, you know, take it away, as they say. Yes. Um, all right. So let me figure out a few things over here. All right. So this is a pretty interesting project. Um, it, it was, it has like a, an interesting background and um, it, it also has like a very special meaning to me because I, I was involved in the design of, of, of a few things that we're gonna talk about. And hopefully the idea is to share a little bit of this, share a little bit of how can we approach multi-channel systems and how can we understand um, like this typical problem of surround systems with base management sections and how to to solve those situations correctly. Specifically why we came up with a product that is able to do that uh, in a very interesting manner. But also um, I'm not the oldest guy at Meyer Sound at all. <laughs> so I want to, to, it's like there's a special person that I want uh, his support to share a little bit of the story behind the AMI project. And the, that person is Juan Carlos Yepes. He's a very good friend of, 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 of mine. And in, it's a part of Latin American Meyer Sound community. So, hi, Juan Carlos, how are you doing? <laughs> uh, you're muted. <laughs> Your uh, microphone Rolin, turned it, off, Juan Carlos. It's a classic. <laughs> I think yes, it's, uh, I've, been, I've been trying to mute, but uh, it's telling me the host won't let me do it. So, <laughs> sorry <laughs> about that. <laughs> How you guys doing? It's good to see you. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, hi guys. Um, it's good to be here. Um, my name is Juan Carlos Yepes, like like uh, Juan David just said, and I'm the Latin American sales manager for Meyer Sound. And uh, when the V asked me to do a short, uh, you know, presentation, uh, uh, history about uh, the AMI system, uh, it was uh, the system, the AMI system was our first studio monitor system over, you know, the last 25 years as it was introduced in uh, 2000, 
2015, so it's 27 years now or, or more, uh, almost almost 30 years. So, um, um, but to understand uh, what the MS system background, uh, we need to talk about the HD1. Uh, the HD1 uh, was one of the most successful products and one, one of the most durable industry standards and it was launched by Meyer Sound in, in 1989. Um, it, it marked a revolution in the field uh, of studio monitors because it was the first two-way studio monitor capable of a near ideal uh, impulse response and, and, and free of phase uh, distortion that is very typical of two-way systems. So they, also the HD1 was uh, the company's first truly really self-powered products. And uh, our engineering team uh, uh, realized that uh, you know, to, to accomplish the very high design goals that were putting for this uh, uh, product, they needed to, to, uh, to achieve it by creating an integrated system that, that will take in, in account all the variables for it. So um, also, if you think about it, this is, I'm, t I'm telling you, 1989, it, the, the HD1 helped uh, uh, popularize the self-powered studio monitors when it was first launched back then. Uh, you know, uh, gradually the rest of the industry recognized the inherent advantage of uh, the cell power uh, system uh, to the point where today basically all, you know, pretty much all near st field studio monitors all cell power. So, so that, was, that was due to the HD1. But the story goes that the HD1 was never really intended to be a product. Originally, it was a device that was designed to be an internal test source for evaluating microphones and measuring systems uh, within the, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you walk through Meyer Sound, through the, the factory, you will see uh, various quality control stations through, you know, through the factory that we used to test our, our, our products while they're being uh, built. However, as I will have it, um, recording engineer Roger Nichols who many of you may know, is uh, super famous for his uh, uh, work with the Steely Dan and John Denver, and he's got, you know, uh, Stevie Wonder and Frank Zappa. He's got over, you know, eight Grammys, and he's got a special uh, merit uh, technical Grammy Award, and, you know, super well-recognized also, uh, uh, you know, uh, James Taylor, Michael Modano. It's, the list is huge. So. Roger Nichols was visiting Meyer Sound. Uh, he was doing a factory tour, um, and he saw this these devices. So he asked uh, uh, Meyer Sound to hear him. And after he heard the prototypes, or or, or or you know what they put together for him, uh, he asked John Meyer to make him a pair of uh, uh, to mix on the Ricky Lee Jones album Flying Cowboys. Immediately after that, it was a success, of course, and it was decided that HD1 would be a product instead of these, uh, uh, you know, device. So, uh, sales took off, and, and the HD1 quickly gained worldwide acceptance uh, among, you know, leading producers, studios engineers, mastering engineers, recording artists. It was, it was amazing what it did because you, you know what what the type of product it was. So, so. Um, um, uh, let's go back to 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 you know to Ami. You know, Ami is uh, it uh, has this this background of the HD one. You know, the cell power, the way to to think about it. You know, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's frequency responses, it's phase response, which makes them you know an eight is being eight hours sitting in front of monitors. It makes it easier. It make it makes it you know you don't get tired of of, of working that long. So. Um, uh, the AMI Precision Studio Monitor is a, is a compact, high-performance uh, loudspeaker designed uh, specifically for audio workflow in music or cinema. It works really, really well for, you know, other type of uh, applications in other type of studios, but it was, it was, it was designed with that in mind, okay? Um, where accurate translation to a larger system is needed is, is what the requirement is part of it. So, uh, and it was developed, you know, to meet the, the, the standards of very demanding uh, audio professionals, you know. So, um, talking about the, the, the specifications for the AMI system, 
the the ME, which is the the the, the compact uh, loudspeaker, uh, you know, monitor system, it's a uh, uh, the the frequency response is 45 hertz to 20 uh, 20k, and uh, phase response is 190 hertz to 20 kilohertz, 45 degrees. Yes, that's not the slide. <laughs> okay, um, the with a linear uh, uh, peak SPL of 120.5 uh, dB, that's uh, with uh, uh, a crest factor of 18.5 on M noise. Okay. Horizontal coverage, it's a horn-loaded loudspeaker. Uh, it's a 80 by 50. The, the horn-loaded is, uh, is because, uh, if you think about it, you know, the, the, the cinema sound has, has also, be, you know, been uh, uh, based on a, on a horn, uh, the, this, this type of horn systems that used to be used uh, back in the 30s when uh, the need of high acoustic gain was uh, was required to 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 you know help the low frequency drivers and low uh, i mean I'm, I'm sorry the low power drivers and low power amplifiers accomplish the high uh, sound pressure levels needed for the cinema and theater so so but these horns always produce large amount of distortion uh, and and uh, and on this case and with the modern techniques and modern web guys, the the Ami offers a a a, a transducer with minimal sound, you know, a, a transducer horn uh, uh, arrangement that that gives very low harmonic distortion, and and has all the advantage of having a small radiator on a waveguide that you can precisely control the area where, where the sound, sound is going. So, so, you know, if you think about it, the small, small domes mounted on a baffle board are very open, very, you know, the polar is very wide. So these will give you a, a much better behave. So, um, so let's keep talking about, I mean, um, it, the, the, tra the transducers are 6.1, uh, 6.5 inch uh, woofer. You know, uh, in a one-inch dome tweeter on a on a horn, um, the the amplifier is a is a class D 900 watt amplifier. It's um, very compact. It's like nine inches for 15 inches for 13 inches. So it's a small uh, uh, small um, a compact monitor and 25 pounds. That's what that's what it is. And and. Part of the system, of course, is the is the Ami sub, which is a very linear uh, sub power subwoofer, uh, with offers you know a clean, punchy transients and excellent phase coherence, and it goes down to 22 hertz in a very compact cabinet, which is amazing for for a product that size. But the Ami sub is it, it, it was it was it was created for the Ami uh, monitors. But it also it works really, really well with other uh, Meyer Sound products, such as uh, the, our line of uh, uh, cinema products, the, the surrounds like HMS 5, 10s, 12, 15s, you know, and all the it, it, to be used in immersive surround applications or across more general applications. So also, you can use it with the Ultra series and it works really, really well. So. Uh, talking about the subwoofers, uh, the frequency response is from 22 hertz to 145. Uh, phase response is 33 hertz to 145, plus or minus 30 degrees. And the linear uh, peak SPLs is 124.5 dB with a crest factor of 11.5. That's again M noise, which is how we do our measures, uh, measurements in our, here at Meyer Sound. So, uh, the low frequency driver is a 15 inch long excursion uh, cone driver and um, has the same uh, uh, an amplifier of a hundred uh, th that is a uh, thousand and a hundred watts peak, also a class D uh, amplifier. And the dimensions are 24 inches wide by 17.5 height and 19 inches deep. It weighs 74 pounds. So the AMI system, what are the advantages of this system? Super accurate because of the flat frequency and phase response. It's very, very linear, reproduces source material with excellent definition and tonal balance. Okay, it's super detailed because of the web guide I was telling you about. 
and very you know clearly defined imaging because again the the horn and the, the twitter super precise very consistent as it is self-powered design like i was telling you it was something that came from the hd1 and and all of all of products nowadays are self-powered the the ami system is super powerful for the size of it it's amazing how powerful it is you have to you have to here to believe it because it, it, you know it's such a small box and so it's convenient because it's compact low weight self power you know it's got a loop through uh, you know to 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 power them and it's, it's super and of course it's super reliable because it's made at the Meyer sound factory in berkeley in california made in the usa so that was that was it for me guys uh thank you very much and 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 please one take it take it you know, to your presentation that we're all, all uh, willing to and ready to hear. Thank you. That's guys. awesome. <laughs> awesome, Juan Carlos. Thank you very much. Back to Juan Sierra. Oh, all right. Can you guys hear me? Is everything okay? Yes, loud and clear, sir. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Um, all right, so now here's the part that I'm sort of <laughs> the right person to talk about this topic, I guess. Um, so, <clears throat> as Juan Carlos was saying, the AMI is not like only the, the monitor, but like the general uh, concept of the system. Whoa, what happened with this? All right, <laughs> sorry. And um, that requires like a little bit of understanding of surround um, systems and how, how like a small footprint loudspeaker in conjunction with a subwoofer can like properly reproduce all the signals that we're intending to reproduce. So the AMI system, which is the combination of the AMI monitor, the AMI subwoofer, and all of this integrated through the AMI base management card or the, the, the uh, alignment processing card, uh, was based on, on, on a statistical approach to understanding the typical behaviors of, of these type of systems in real rooms. And uh, that together with an analytical approach to understanding how to properly design base management filters, which as I'll, I'll show you later, guys, it's, this is, it's not like the, the, the typical things that you would expect on just aligning a couple of, of, of speakers. So the first thing is to really understand how, um, how multi-channel systems work. Oops, let me see. All right, so how to understand a multi-channel system? So let's think about it as, as um, we started with the, the idea of having a left and right channels that were going to reproduce all of our material. And then we sort of started an adventure to, to, to have more and more speakers, right? And this, these other speakers, which are like the surround or the, 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 the idea of, of having a sound field of, 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 of information around us. Um, we're representing the, those as full range systems. Um, then there was like an idea of introducing, okay, maybe we can have something like an, a dedicated channel for low frequency uh, effects. And this is like an important distinction because people often think that uh, this channel is intended to reproduce the low frequency information that the speakers cannot reproduce and that's not entirely the case. The, the, the LFE channel on a multi-channel system is intended to reproduce um, effect, like sound effects in information in the, in the movie world or, or like low frequency information that is specifically designed to be reproduced by that speaker. And not, not because the other speakers cannot reproduce it, but because we want to have a dedicated channel for that purpose. Um, However, it is true that sometimes if, if we think about these guys as multi-channel, um, like multi-way systems where the low way is actually combined into a single thing that is called the base management section. And that base management section is actually the low frequency information that the, the surround satellites, as they are called sometimes, cannot reproduce. Uh, so there's a special distinction between the base management section and the low frequency effects channel. The low frequency effects channel is, a, is, a, is, is actually material that comes from, from the content creator and the base management section is more of a, a, an optimization on the system to be able to combine all of the low frequency information into a single driver to hopefully like reproduce it 
accurately and efficiently, but also in a more economical manner. We don't want necessarily want to invest on having full range systems on all the speakers and especially with the, the 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 technologies that we're seeing today like Dolby Atmos and having like 60 channels of, of full range systems would be very very expensive so it's a good idea to have like a base managed section that can control or, or deal with all of the low frequency information of the rest of the channels nonetheless it's really really important to understand that this is very very different like this is one th oh sorry this is one thing, the base management section is one thing, and the low frequency effects information is another thing. Um, is this working? Okay, yeah. <laughs> so this is one thing and this is a separate thing. However, I mean, nobody really wants to have those two things as separate things, so <laughs> we can combine them. It's just that conceptually we need to understand that there are two separate th things being reproduced by that loudspeaker. Even though it's a subwoofer, which is the actual device that reproduces these signals, it's a different signal to have the base management section and, and the low frequency effects uh, channel. Sometimes they also call it low frequency enhancement channel. Um, yeah, but it, it's, 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 it's its own thing that comes from the content itself. All right. So uh, the problem with AMI is the, the general system is or the question that was asked was if it is possible to design a decoupled system as we have like the main speaker and the subwoofer uh, and produce like a consistent set of satisfactory results in multiple environments. And as you might imagine, this is pretty challenging because you're basically asking whether you can design an alignment that will universally work in multiple environments without having to do measurements in place. Um, nonetheless, that was sort of what we were able to achieve. <clears throat> so I'm going to, to explain a little bit how that works. So uh, why this keeps happening to me? I give these lectures in Spanish and then <laughs> I find like little titles that were not <laughs> translated. Sorry about that guys. All right, so the, the, um, the idea of, of, of how to solve it uh, was to approach it because all of these are linear and time invariant systems then we can sort of decompose all of this information into multiple parts so from a conceptual point of view we were trying to to design all of this around a framework of a Meyer sound mindset where things just work um, in general all loud or Meyer sound loudspeakers they don't have like a lot of, of of controls on the on the speakers themselves like they are just supposed to work and a speaker is just supposed to be that a uh, device that transforms acoustical energy into elect in, sorry electrical energy into acoustical energy without uh, any transformation if possible <clears throat> we also wanted to think about how the users were if this product is intended for professionals and semi professional users and um, <clears throat> to some extent aimed at people working in post production and the movie industry film industry um, but again, as we like to say, admire sound like a speaker is just a speaker. And if, if it goes well in your living room, that would be nice. <laughs> so uh, the price needs to be logical in, in the sense that in theory, you could, you could achieve certain, like you could, you could do some alignment with a Galaxy processor, but this base management card that I'm talking about, and I actually have one of the early prototypes here I was, like um, one of the um, uh, electrical engineers or electronic engineers at Meyer Sound, Paul Kohut, was kind enough to to give it one of the first prototypes to me because I was heavily involved in the development and it's like a, <laughs> my little baby. So um, it, it needs to be logically priced in the sense that if, if you have to spend as much as a Galaxy on this processing card, maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense to go that way. <laughs> And also we wanted to protect a lot the, the Meyer sound, sound signature of the AMI system. That means the processing card is not intended to change at all the behavior of the loudspeaker itself. It's just an integration tool between those two worlds so that it's it, like the reproduction of the base management section and the low frequency effects channel is, is done properly and behave correctly in, in as many acoustical environments as possible. And to solve, solve all of this, 
we did a decomposition process. So again, because all of these are linear and time invariant systems, uh, we, we have the, the possibility of understanding these as separate chunks or, or separate problems. So the decomposition uh, was based on, okay, we have a room, we have some sensitivity problems because you have different loudspeakers interacting. Maybe we have some, uh, some signal flow issues and maybe you have to follow certain standards. And in this case, there are a few of those. There's been some development and some evolution of the uh, film industry side of standards. But um, one of the ones that I like the most is like the ITU 775, which also talks about, uh, about the philosophy of, of mixing in a surround system and understanding specifically the low frequency uh, effects or enhancement channel. Actually, they call it enhancement channel. So I'll share a little bit more about that later. Um, all right. So a possible solution for all of this is um, the traditional path. And in a traditional path, you have, um, you have your common subwoofer where you have a, a ton of parameters. You have a polarity switch, you have a variable filter, variable phase, variable gain, variable slope, and everything is variable because sort of the, the, the manufacturer doesn't want to hold the responsibility of, of ensuring that the alignment is going to work properly. Not only because they don't actually want it, but because it is true that it's pretty hard to make sure that the system is going to behave correctly. On top of that, many subwoofers don't usually work, like they're not in exactly designed to specifically work with a, uh, a specific satellite. So you have products that are intended to work with multiple loudspeakers of the same brand, or even to work with any loudspeaker. They're just intended to be a subwoofer that is going to be integrated with something else. Um, that creates a lot of problems for the user because they have to set all of these parameters properly, be able to measure them accurately, and have the expertise and know-how of how to, to deal with all of these situations. And that might not be the case. So what you get is often underperformance of subwoofers in real life situations to the point that it is, I, I would say it's relatively common for people to think that subwoofers are more of a problem than a solution, just because it's really hard to make all of those parameters work properly. So, in this case, we had a different approach to it. We did a decomposition of the problem. And it's, a, okay, if you have two amplifiers that are in series, you can understand the whole thing as the composite amplifier of 20x amplification factor. Or you could sort of think of, okay, maybe you have an amplifier one that is 10x, and then we have an amplifier two that is 2x. And because of that, you can sort of analyze where each of these problems come from and solve uh, whichever problems do not relate to the acoustical reality of the speaker in a real uh, life situation. So you have acoustical interactions where obviously are heavily dependent on the room. You have some part that is related to the sensitivity relationship between the speakers, which is not related to the room. Uh, you have some um, separation of signals, signal flow pro problems and, and these type of things, which again are not related to the room. and. And then the question is, well, if you're doing all of this, would you really need all of those parameters? And the interesting thing is that no, actually our processor only has basically two parameters. And one of those is <laughs> to comply with standards, not really to, to do any type of calibration. So I think that's pretty interesting. Um, so let's talk about a little bit of the, the problems that are behind all of this. Uh, the first one and easier one is the easiest one is the sensitivity analysis. And basically the idea is that if you have multiple loudspeakers reproducing the same signal, they're supposed to, to like covering a, a frequency range, they're supposed to reproduce um, an equivalent pressure per frequency. And that is not always the case when you start with a subwoofer and a, and a satellite because their electronics are different and their efficiencies are different. So the sensitivity in general at the end of the day is different. Um, because of that, you often have the case where the subwoofer has a huge range on its gain capabilities, meaning that <laughs> like a trim knob on a subwoofer can go from minus infinity to plus 12. 
which is a crazy amount of, of change. And then it's hard to set up the right value for it. It's just trying to compensate for the sensitivity differences with the satellite. So uh, maybe there are better ways of achieving that relationship and making sure that it stays put. So um, that is one of the things. Uh, then we have, oh, why is this thing doing this? Ah, sorry, I skipped a slide, all right. Then we have the room and, well, rooms are a mess. And basically, I, I like a phrase, there's an acoustician, um, John Story, who, who once told me, well, if you, have, if you want no problems with modes, then you shouldn't be in a room <laughs> because that is like an inherent property of rooms. So um, there was a question of, of how to preserve the alignment across multiple environments. What are the modal effects on the phase and, and magnitude response of the system? And if there's a best generic or, 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 or as, as close to optimal location for the subwoofer in this case, and that has been broadly discussed, but we had a, a slightly different approach to it. Uh, for the standards, we have problems like well, Dolby Stereo started as a left, center, right, and surround system. And because of that, um, there's like, there was a single surround as a whole matrix of speakers that when it was separated into left surround and right surround, there, it, there was a decision to preserve com backwards compatibility to allow three degrees of attenuation on the surround field left and surround field right so that the average power would, would be zero as it was before. So we have some of, of this back history of standard that, that define what we can do in a surround system. And this is the one that I really find interesting and is like one of on the first attempts on surround systems, uh, the six channel um, system with the LFE integration had, was stored on a magnetic tape or, or magnetic medium. And because of that, well, there was some, some stuff related to noise reduction, the emphasis, post emphasis, and even compounding curves, uh, which are not used used in this case or anything, but uh, there was a decision to to store the information on the magnetic tape with an attenuation of 10 dBs, and that is sort of a process on something that happens on on the film side on what's known as the chain A, and that is sort of where the content is produced. Uh, but because the signal is stored 10 dBs lower, then the, the reproduction of that signal needs to be 10 dBs louder. And that was uh, an attempt to increase the dynamic range or to have a little bit more of headroom on the low frequency effects channel. Um, and that's something that we're still carrying today, even though it might not really be needed. Like on the, <clears throat> on the digital me medium, we don't have this type of problems. And it, it's sort of like a backwards compatibility decision that that was made at some point with all of these standards uh, and I'll, I'll talk about more about this part in a, because it, it really affects some of the things and decisions we made um, <clears throat> all right so there's uh, come on all right so base management, I think this is one of the most interesting ones is, uh, well, Amis can't reproduce 30 Hertz. They are actually really, really good speakers. They go really, really low for, for their size, but 30 Hertz is pretty low. <laughs> like when we're talking about 30 Hertz is pretty, pretty long wave waveform. So uh, it's a huge wavelength and it's, it's not easy for a, a, a small footprint loudspeaker to reproduce that information. So we need base management, that's, that's okay. And we're sort of going to combine all of these channels into the LFE uh, and the LFE channel into the subwoofer. So we need base management, but this doesn't seem like a straightforward process. And it's something that is many, many times overlooked by manufacturers and, and people doing base management and is how to combine these, these signals properly. I'll show some, some demonstrate, I'll, I'll, I'll do a demonstration of how this, this might be problematic. So the solution is, um, well, for, for sensitivity matching is just doing what is known as free field measurements. And uh, that is basically to, to be able to measure the loudspeaker without the interaction of a room and get the actual 
um, free field sound pressure level difference uh, between those two speakers. And we can do that, but that is not a process that you can often do on your home. You need like some know-how how to actually ad address this problem and how to do, do those measurements properly. So we just did those measurements, calculated the difference of gains and how these speakers should interact in a, in a free field environment without having to do with the acoustics of the room. So that's, that's fine. Uh, for the standards, I don't have a particular slide because we just have to comply with those. <clears throat> and for the base management section, this is where things get really, really interesting. So, <sighs> collateral effects of base management. The ITU 775 specifies that the LFE channel is supposed to have material that is not phase coherent with the main channels. But as any content creator will tell you, like LFE channels are built through, mostly through AUX sense and like derivation of main signals that are going into that channel. If you have a Pro Tools interface or a Pro Tools rig, you'll see that the, the, the surround panel is, has a, literally an, an AUX send or a derivation of that signal into the LFE channel. So <laughs> the standard might say that the coherence is not necessary, it's not necessary, but that's a little bit of a naive approach because in practice that happens many, many, many times. Uh, there's some experience on, on, on re-recording engineers to, to sort of decorrelate the signals and do some processes to, to have some independence, but the reality is that there's always going to be some coherent material. And because of that, there's some electrical interaction between the base management and the LFE. So we must assure like an equivalent phase between the, the, the transfer function that is measured between the LFE channel and the listening position and the transfer function that is represented by sending a signal into one of these main channels and measuring the, the, the base management section. Because their phases need to be equivalent there's only as a limited subset of, of special filters that we can use. And to do that, we need to, like what we're attempting to do is to ensure a, an even magnitude response on this interaction. And obviously if you have this type of, of, of filter over here, uh, uh, come on. If you have this type of filter over here, then there's gonna be some phase relationship that is going to be missing over here and it's probably not going to, to behave properly. So uh, we just need to introduce some all pass filter over there that is able to um, equalize the phase of this section of the low frequency effects channel section to the base management section because obviously the base management section needs a, a, a filter to to capture all of the low frequency information of the main channels. Uh, then if you do all of that correctly, the summing point is going to behave correctly and then the subwoofer, even before of all of this acoustical mess that will come later, is going to, to behave correctly. So what are the effects of non-equivalent phase? So here I have a representation of the main level and the LFE send and um, what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do is sort of cross fade between those and you'll see that at some point you're going to have to you're going to have some some heavy interaction between one and the other because their faces might not be exactly the same oh no is this all right so that is the proper interaction between those but I'm seeing that you guys were not seeing the, the, the actual video. So let me share that really quickly. Um, how's everything going, Merlin? Is, are there any questions or anything going on on, on on Facebook or something? We're doing okay. Um, as far as I can tell, there are no questions. And um, we saw the second half of the animation. Uh, be sure to optimize for, for video. Yep. Uh, that was not the, the, the problem, it's just that I think that there, there was an overlay between some of those. I see. Uh, 
let me go to that slide on the computer and I'll share that little detail. All right, so uh, all of them are just fading in and out between the main level and the LFE send. So this is the proper interaction between them. And as you can see, uh, the magnitude response is behaving properly as you would expect. The LFE channel doesn't have any filter, so that's why it's the, the signal that shows full range information. And the main, this is the base managed section of the main channel, so that is what is being derived. Their, action, the, their interaction is as it should be. But if I, um, here's, let me see, where is this other video? Ah, I'm not seeing that one. Um, all right, no problem. Give me just a second. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Optimal opus filter. Oh, fine, found it. All right. Sorry about that. No problem. It's live. So <laughs> this is again the optimal, we, which we already saw three times. <laughs> but I wanted to show what are the effects of not having optimal phase relationships. So this is a suboptimal relationship. And you'll see that the, there's nowhere there's no cancellation anywhere, but the problem is that there's less summation at some points with certain uh, magnitude relationships. So what you end up seeing is sort of like a, a frequency range that adds more than another frequency range. And it's like an odd behavior. And it's often overlooked because if you have the LFE channel by itself, this will not happen. If you have the base management channel by itself, it won't happen again. But if you have a combination of them on a specific magnitude relationship, then the interaction will be messed up. And that is sort of this point where you're sort of getting a, a, a significant boost at certain frequency and some attenuation below and above. Uh, and this is the, the <laughs> very, very, very naive approach where you don't care about phase at all and you're not thinking about base management and LFE as separate things and you're just combining them randomly which to be honest is the approach of many of, of these products to these days. And what you get is that at some point on the right combination of magnitudes, then the phase is going to be so off that the interaction is, is gonna be just too heavy. So you have very good uh, base when you have only the, the main channel, you have very good base when you have only the LFE channel. And at some point when you have a combination of them and you have a huge correlation between these two, two, two signals, you get a huge dip in the, in the low frequency section. So that is a little bit of what, what all of these special filters and all of that is trying to achieve. Uh, I love right. these videos. They're awesome. <laughs> no, you, you, I you think can, they're like... It's so clear. You can, clear you can clearly see the ripple. You can clearly see the ripple throughout the crossover because you're not phase compliant. So I, I, I think they're awesome. And it's important to understand that these are not, um, these, these effects are not on an, the acoustical side of things. It's uh, completely an electrical interaction. So it's not like you can get away with things like, oh, I'm just gonna move a couple of feet to the right or to the left and the interaction will be less obvious. Right. Because <laughs> it is they're, just happening on the electrical side. They're, they're joined at the hip even before they left the loudspeaker. Exactly. Um, I guess I, I could continue here. Can you still see me, right? Yes, oh. we can see you. Ah. And we see your, we see your presentation. All right. So let's keep these guys. <clears throat> All 
for the fourth time. <laughs> All right, so, <clears throat> oh, no, no, this is the presentation in Spanish, sorry. <laughs> Lo siento, the... no hablo español. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, stop share. Sorry about all of that, guys. You, I, I hope you can forgive me because I'm doing a bunch of webinars and at the same time in Spanish and English and doing still stuff for the company and stuff. So, uh, okay. Can you please open the right presentation? All right. Um, Sure. Yes, right. sir. We have video. Ah, the slide. <laughs> All right. So, um, what we have here is um, how to how to build these these equivalent phases of between the base management section and the LFE channel. And the problem is that. This is not a, a, an intuitive solution. It's not very common. We have used this type of solution for a while, although we didn't exactly know, or it was, it was not exactly known because of that, and that is the squared border wall filter, and that is better known as the linkwitz riley filter. So here I'm showing border wall, square border wall filters that have equivalent faces to some all-pass border wall filters. And that's sort of something that you can use to have exact matching phases as can be shown in these these plots so the 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 phases on the on the bottom side they are completely equivalent but then uh, there are other solutions and all of this is sort of outlined on a paper that I wrote for the AES a couple of years ago and is okay here and is that you can also build uh, equivalent phase filters for all of the other typical classes. So like a Chebyshev one filter can also have equivalent phases. Uh, a Chebyshev two squared filter can also have equivalent phases. And an elliptic filter can also be built to have equivalent all pass, fa uh, all -pass filter phases. Um, the, the catch is that it, they need to be squared filters. And as you might imagine, that is not what is often implemented in all of these um, base management sections. So it's a little bit tricky to, to, to work around all of this information. And finally, uh, there's this idea of the room and how the, the room is affecting the, the magnitude, the transfer function relationship between the, the loudspeaker position and the listening position. And an interesting way to understand that is sort of to think as the room itself as a, as a filter. And when you think about the room as a filter, the transfer function is defined by the listening and the, the, the reproduction position or the source and the listener position. When you have that information, um, if the room acts as like a filter, it is just gonna be a convolution between the, the loudspeaker magnitude or frequency response and this special filter that is defined by the acoustics of the room. Um, it is completely defined by the source and listener position. And we even did like an interesting experiment where you can swap both of those and get the exact same transfer function. Just because the, the, the reflections connecting all of those, like these two points are exactly the same going forward or backwards. And um, the dimensions of the room, because they completely define the model distribution uh, is like, well, not all dimensions are equally likely. This is a, a product specifically defi defined for, for like a small to medium size mixing environment. It's not intended to be installed on a, on a football field or anything like that where the room modes will be at very low frequencies. So there are certain frequencies that are more likely to misbehave. They're not equally likely to, to have some problems. So is there a frequency range that we can, can understand in a better way? And in this animation, I'll show that this behavior is not, is not like even across all frequencies. This is just a, a very simplistic model. But as you can see, there's certain frequency ranges that are not often affected by some 
um, mode going into interaction into that location. And if, as, as you go higher and higher in frequencies, because there's more modal accumulation, then those frequencies are more likely to misbehave. So in this case, I'm just moving the listener position across the room in some odd shape to, to evaluate the behavior of this filter. And you should be able to see that <laughs> some frequencies are very, very, very interesting. They, you move around the room a lot and they're not changing by that much. Whereas others are going into cancellation and out of cancellation many, many times when you move around. Um, so having that in mind, we did this experimental approach where, um, where the, the, there was a statistical analysis of this behavior in multiple rooms. We took more than 800 measurements in multiple rooms, multiple positions of subwoofers, multiple positions of microphones. Everything was measured with SIM3 measurement system with a dual FFT method. And um, we went to various spaces with various degrees of acoustical treatment. And we moved the, not only in a single space, one position, but we also moved the whole system around the room, multiple positions of the soft, of the system, of, of, of space uh, size. So you have like a, a couple of pictures of those. And um, I think that was a very interesting process. It, the, 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 the interesting side comes when you try to analyze all of this information and you are sort of struggling with the statistics of all of this and the, the huge amount of, of data that you have. Uh, but the interesting side is, well, the magnitude response on the satellites changes mm, not drastically at every single frequency, but there are certain preferences for certain positions for certain frequencies. And the idea is that over here, we have all of the, all of the measurements. We have all of the, um, uh, can you guys see my mouse, right? Yes. So you have, you have all of these measurements and we are able to sort of estimate this, the standard deviation of that over here. And when you see like a place where you have very low standard deviation, that is a, a nice place to be because it means that that magnitude response is not changing much across all of these measurements. On the phase response side, um, you see very clearly, not on this specific plot because it's a little bit of a mess, but during the analysis that the distance is critical. So maintaining this distance to the, the, to the sweet spot is, is a very important thing. And because distance um, affects like the phase deviation due to distance is greater at higher frequencies because the wavelengths are shorter, then having a, a shorter, a lower frequency for this interaction is, is, is interesting because you would have to move the loudspeaker by a, a significant amount of, of, of distance to have a significant effect on the phase response. So when you go higher and higher in frequencies, the standard deviation just increases and increases. Um, and when you analyze the subwoofer, you see a, a very interesting trend and it's like, okay, the magnitude response is sort of well behaved and there's some, some papers outlining the benefits of, of aiming for the corners or, or the sides of the room, but that is sort of the optimizing the magnitude response. We're interested in, my, in optimizing the phase response relationship so that the interaction is, a, is appropriate. And in that case, <laughs> there's like a, a clear like statement of if you stick to very low frequencies on the interaction and you maintain the, the distance between the loudspeaker and the listening position, then you would get much better interaction and less, um, less deviation on your transfer functions. So because of that, the result is that you have a system where you can move it to different locations. And if you design correctly these filters and make sure that the base management and the LFE section is correctly behaved and that, that you're optimizing for these specific frequencies, very low frequencies where the interaction is appropriate, then everything behaves properly. <laughs> like you move that system to different places and the, the, the measurements behave very well. So we it did, we even did some demonstrations where we went to a recording studio, set up the system, and the, the, 
the engineer of the recording studio said, I've been trying to calibrate this system for a couple of weeks and it's been a little bit tough. Uh, it's, it's not an easy space. We're dealing with some acoustical issues and stuff and stuff. So we set up the system and we set up the microphone measurement without doing any corrections or anything, any calibrations, just the, the base management card and that's it. And we did the measurements and it was fine. And he was happy with the results. So it's probably not the optimal, optimal solution in the sense that you could go one mile ahead and, and further optimize this behavior because it's an statistical optimality. But still it was very interesting to see it in action and see how a recording engineer was very pleased about the, the result without having um, like spending a lot of time on the calibration process and all of that. So the conclusions, some thoughts about all of this process. Um, let me change a little bit here. I want to, for you guys to, to be able to see something. All right. Oh, now I'm going to share this thing. Uh, this one. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> Um, it's, it's an interesting project in general because of all the implications that it has, but it's interesting to see that the typical implementation, which has all of these things, it has left, right channel, center, left, surround, right, surround, and then you do high pass filtering to get the signals for the satellites and a low pass filter to get all of the low frequency information. Um, all of these crossover frequency phase gain summing it has some fundamental problems that are not entirely solved in typical implementations. So <laughs> it's interesting to see that having a different approach, you can go to, to something like this and you go to, to a very, very simple implementation where the AMIs are not changed at all. There's no high pass filter for them because now you have flexibility on the design of the base management filter and independence with the low frequency effects channel. And what people tend to do is sort of combine those two. You, you sort of say, okay, the satellites are going to go to uh, down to 120 hertz because the LFE channel goes up to 120 hertz. And I don't want to have to deal with that mess between those two things uh, because it's hard to solve it. But then you have a loudspeaker that is not reproducing like two octaves of information or like an octave and a half of information that could have been reproduced by that speaker just because you're sort of dealing with a tough problem. But in this implementation, you have almost no controls. You only have a plus six, minus six dBs on the subwoofer just because of room loading effects on, on low frequency information. And you have all of, it, all, all, of, all of it has been optimized from the design point of view to make sure everything behaves properly. So it's an interesting change of mindset. And the effect of that is, is, is simply uh, this AMI system based management integration module. And we have two versions like the stereo version has 2.1 system and a, and a 7.1 system. So it, it expanded eventually to 7.1 more than 5.1. And it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting reality. You just set up all of the connections, do all of the, um, like follow some guidelines on how to set up your speakers, like preserving critical distances and stuff and stuff. And then it's done. Your system should, should play a very, very uh, well-behaved, um, should have a very well-behaved um, transfer function. Even if it's if in your room, it's, it's a little bit, it shouldn't be like the worst room ever, but if it's a reasonably well-treated room, it will behave properly. So I think that was an interesting thing. This is just a picture of, of the physical card. Um, and Finally, <laughs> let's go to check the quick demo for all of this because I know some of these concepts are hard to, to grasp when, when there's no like actual things going on and just some slides. So I believe we're a little bit on the edge of time, but is it we're, okay? We're all good. We're all good. Just be sure to turn on your camera. 
Um, oh, I, you guys were not seeing me. Sorry. Well, that's fine. It's, this was a nice moment to remind you. Thank you so much. So uh, I'm going to move to a different computer where I have uh, some setup sharing all of this information. And I want to make sure that all of these Zoom things are working properly. Okay. We can Optimize see the analyze. For, uh, all right. So like integrating a two-way system is not, it's not an easy thing, but it's not entirely complicated. You can just uh, take some measurements and make sure that things are behaving properly. And this is actually like the, the, the transfer function of DME, it, as Juan Carlos was saying, because this, um, because this phase is so well behaved down to so such a low frequency, the input response is a very nice looking input response. And um, yeah, so, so if you want to integrate that with the subwoofer at this very low frequency as I'm doing it here, 40 something Hertz, then it's, um, well, the, the AMI is unchanged. You don't have to do any type of processing on the AMI and the uh, subwoofer can complete that information properly by feeling that um, extra octave down to 20 something Hertz or something. So it's, um, it's not that complicated, that works well. Now the problem comes more from um, when you have the integration with the LFE channel, the LFE channel needs to go up to 120 Hertz. So if I just mute all of the information going to the uh, left channel and I just open the LFE channel, then I should see that. So it's not like I can low pass the base management section. Um, the, the subwoofer, as a whole to make sure that this happens because the, the LFE information needs to go up to 120 Hertz. On top of that, then you have like this boost of plus 10 dBs for the, for the LFE channel. Um, and that sort of hides the problem sometimes because if you have some, uh, some, yeah, some relationship like this, then because of the magnitude difference, you don't often see the interaction. And because that interaction is not obvious, then um, <laughs> it's missed by many, by many people. So check this, this little detail. If the base management section is engaged, sorry, if the LFE section is not engaged, then we have the proper transfer function for the base management section. And if the LFE section is engaged, then you have an accentuation of 10 dBs. Oh, wow. We're just doing some construction work up here. <laughs> and if I mute the, the left channel, then the, the signal reproduced by the subwoofer should drop slightly on this lower section. So if I mute the left channel, then uh, that drops slightly. I'm going to, to go to a less obvious gain. And that is that sort of odd shape is the one that you should have because it shows that the, the, the LFE channel is extending all the way up here, up to 120, and the base management section is just adding some additional information because that was in the content itself. So again, if I mute the left channel, you have the proper interaction. And if I uh, mute the LFE channel, then you get the proper base management section. Um, I want to maybe change this to, to the a more typical subwoofer implementation or base management implementation in general. Uh, it should change soon. Is that working? Yes. <laughs> so this is a type of thing that happens. You have um, to deal with the base management section, the LFE section and the left channel. And then you're sort of trying to optimize all of those parameters that we were talking about, like the phase, the, the, the filter. So typical thing is just go all the way up to something like 
the filter put that on 120 hertz and use a very high or steep uh, crossover point, drop the gain of the, of the subwoofer because they have different sensitivities. So let's drop that around here. And that's sort of working, like the summation should sort of work more or less. Uh, the faces are sort of working again. Uh, but then <laughs> once you start introducing the gain of the, if I remove the gain of the LFE or introduce the gain of the LFE, you start seeing some weird behaviors because, because these things are not interacting as they should interact. Um, so this is no LFE. This is only the LFE. Uh, sorry, it's only the LFE. Uh, and you see that the faces change slightly because they are not correctly matched and stuff like that. And some other people might say, okay, let's go to a very low frequency. And this is the type of problem that I was telling you guys that people try to avoid. And is that you might get a better transfer function for the base management only. I think that sort of looks okay. But then when you introduce the LFE channel, <laughs> you get some <laughs> like abnormalities in different frequencies because their faces are not matched. And they, that is further hidden by the fact that the LFE is all the way up and the signal of the main channel is lower. But if you correctly match the gains, you see that <laughs> that it creates like deeps and awful behaviors on the transfer function. Um, so that was pretty much like the idea behind all of this project to match the faces correctly, go to a very low frequency on the crossover section to, to match like, to be able to take advantage of, of the longer wavelengths and the reduced interaction of those frequencies into the transfer function and optimize that behavior. And um, with all of that, uh, like we were able to, to come up with something that, that really optimizes the behavior of, of this for an, in, from a statistical point of view. But again, the, the, like be aware of all of these problems on other base management processors. And I can sort of assure you that some of these will show up in some way or another. And it is not as easy as one thinks that, okay, let's just filter out this thing and let's take this stuff apart. The, the, the base management processing is a, is a complicated uh, concept in itself. And if you don't see all of the problems in it, then you're gonna pay the price later. <laughs> so I think that was pretty much it. And if there's any questions in particular for this, um, please let me know. I can help and try to answer any of those. Excellent. Juan Sierra Lozano, much appreciated. If you have any questions for Juan Sierra, please make use of the chat and we'll be happy to attempt at answering those questions to the best of our abilities. I'm starting to think that people are more chatty in Spanish. <laughs> well, you have a, you have a Spanish audience, um, so. <laughs> So we have one question by Guillaume and he's asking, maybe you can give us more explanations about your configurations of the systems that you're measuring. So remember that it was specifically designed for, for, the, for the AMI system. So it is a little bit of a, a huge advantage for a, for a company to provide a, what is known as a holistic solution. You're not designing like a subwoofer that is intending to work with any speaker or a speaker that is intending to work with any subwoofer or a base management that is able to connect those two in any fashion. You're designing something that is specifically designed and optimized from the design point of view to, to, um, to com correctly integrate those, the, the, the AMI and the MI sub through the base management section. So in any, any of these measurements, there was always like the AMI measurement, the AMI sub measurement, and some integration module that was being optimized to achieve that. Um, I hope that was the question that you were asking me. If not, please let me know. Um, Excellent. And then we have, we have a question of, uh, from Clark and he's wondering, are there any standards that dictate the distance between speakers? Uh, there's a couple of, of, of interesting standards. Uh, I can recall 
I can't exactly recall the number, although I might be able to search that quickly. The, the, uh, there's a couple of IEC standards that specify like optimal conditions for listening rooms. And uh, that is an interesting thing to have in mind because you might imagine that some absurd situations don't make any sense at all. If you have five loudspeakers around you and they are like 30 centimeters away from you, that is obviously very short distance. So it's not like a, a good combination to create a, a nice round uh, sound field. Um, but all of these like near field loudspeakers are intended to be like 1.8 meters, 2.5 meters away from you, maybe a little bit on that range. Uh, what the standard does say is that they're supposed to be equidistant from the sweet spot on a simple surround system. Right, By because, simple, I mean, because the AMI system does not allow for time alignment. The, the, the base management configuration card, it, it is even like all uh, an, an all analog processor, so there's no latency or anything added. Right. It's super transparent, so there's no, no time alignment in that sense. If there's phase alignment in the sense that everything was optimized sure. to achieve that, but not time displacement as latency or pure delay. Exactly. So that's why the loudspeakers have to be equidistant to the, to the, to the uh, preferred listening position. Right. No, although take into account that it's, a, <laughs> it's an interesting thing that when, once you design a crossover that is that low, like a wavelength of 40 hertz is so long that if you move your subwoofer like one meter away, it's still not going into cancellation. No, no, no. <laughs> so but I was, I was also referring to the uh, surround channels, like in a 7.1 yes. application, yes. you have to be equidistant yes. to, the, to the loudspeakers. We do recommend that the, the subwoofer is also equidistant. So that's sure. why I'm, I'm pointing that out. Sure. Um, but but uh, let me see if I can find the the name of the standard, IEC standard, that talks about that uh, optimality. Um, so, oh, it was an ITU. It's an ITU 1116. Uh, I think that was started on 1997 or something. Uh, it has some revisions now, but it's a good starting point for what the listening room should look like. But regarding the surround system, particularly, there's a couple of other standards. I particularly like the ITU 775. It's very simple, very, uh, it's not super extensive. And it, it, ex it explains also the conceptual aspects of mixing for, for surround systems. Excellent. Thank you for the extra collateral. Does anyone else have a, a question at this point for Juan Sierra? May not be able to answer every question, but shoot, shoot. <laughs> I like questions. <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, uh, big shout out to Juan Sierra. Thank you for a very interesting um, presentation on the AMI system, plug and play multi-channel uh, without bells and whistles. And that means that, um, as I said, thank you, Juan Sierra. Um, this webinar, as always, will be available on our YouTube channel, Thinking Sound, Meyer Sounds, Thinking Sound, uh, within the next couple of hours or so. And um, regarding uh, next week, next week on Monday, we do our live rerun um, due to popular demand. And that means that we're going to do the introduction to MapXT. So if you're not familiar with MapXT, be sure to join us this Monday. Uh, and then, and then uh, Monday, I will also uh, inform you about what we have in mind for the remainder of next week. Uh, for now, thank you for joining us. Uh, and please stay safe, please stay healthy, and best to you and your loved ones. Happy weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.